Gentlemen, boys and ghouls, to all of our non-binary friends and everyone on the spectrum and in between, welcome to episode 16? 16 indeed. 16 of The Shudder Show. Oh yeah. I am your uh, Freaky Friday actual host today, David Marlowe, and I'm here with my my modest co-host, Ken Statnick. How you doing, bud? I'm just, it's just another day in paradise, buddy. Looking forward to... The coup that may or may not happen in a couple of days, depending on when you're listening to this. And Ken, what, what, what are we doing on Wednesday? Uh, we are going to be drinking uh, heavily during the daytime to celebrate uh, both the leaving of someone who sucks and the arrival of someone who sucks less. But it's better. Yes. Objectively better. Objectively better. better. Someone who actually is literally doing the job and has... But still at least, sucks. but a, better. A better. plan. I'm, I'm happy. Yes, I'm happy. Yes. I'm, I'm, I'm happy that this happened instead he, of the other way it could have happened. Yes, he'll be coming over early in the morning. Um, to which I will then be pouring the last of the best whiskey that I have in the house, um, and then we will be Post-mating drinking. Postmating probably more more whiskey. Oh po- yeah, postmating. Well, oh no, there we then there's just shittier whiskey. Well, okay. Yeah. And then we'll just be getting all sorts of day junk, drunk and going down the top twenties list of all the crazy shit that this human turd has done top 20 to ways to mash your hands with a hammer <laughs> so yeah so i, I it's good like i, I want to start this off on like a nice like heavy but f- funny note because the movie that we're talking about deals in, with a very delicate subject it is uh it, it is pretty serious pretty fast out of the gate there's a bunch of children they're traumatized then there's like a school shooting and then there's a bunch of homeless children, and they're chased by the cartel. At least which, two of the children die. Yeah, it's a real not positive, happy, fun, good time movie. It's yeah. not a. Um, we, we've we've had some fun movies. Tammy and the T Rex is a good time. Oh yeah. Uh, real real romp. Tiger tigers are not afraid is not fun. Exactly. Uh, that does not mean it's not good. But, it is a. But, I I would say I, this is one movie that I particularly enjoyed. I know you you felt a little differently about it, which, of course, I'm going to say, so yeah, the film that we are doing is called uh, Tigers Are Not Afraid, and that was uh, directed by uh, Issa Lopez, uh, who was born in Mexico City, and is, is quite well known in Mexico, and especially um, uh, quite popular with Guillermo del Toro, and she will actually uh, be... He's producing the next film that she's working on. Friend of the show, Guillermo del Toro. Yeah, of friend of friend of the show, Guillermo del Toro. I have been to his museum; it is excellent. Um, oh, you went to the exhibit at MoMA. I did. I says did I. One of the best exhibits I've seen in a long time. I uh, I, I went. Well, I tried to go to the Kubrick one when it was in MoMA, but uh, unfortunately, or sorry, not at MoMA at the uh, the, the LACMA. Um, unfortunately, I couldn't get in that day. They were sold out. Now, the good thing is, is I'd actually been to the Kubrick archives before it was even a museum exhibit. Really, I um. My sister was living in London at the time, and this was shortly after the Kubrick family had made the donation of the Kubrick archives to the, uh, I, wanted, I believe it was the, the London, London Museum of Art. And I was going to go visit my sister, and so I just took some time on my lunch break and called and was like, hey, I'm a college student. I was not in college at the time. Uh, I'm writing a thesis on Stanley Kubrick, I was not in college at the time and was not writing pieces. <laughs> uh, I would love to be able to get access to the Kubrick archives uh, for an afternoon or an evening. And they were like, absolutely, no problem at all. Uh, nobody ever asked me for an ID. Nobody ever asked for a, t- a teacher's referral. Nobody asked me anything. I just showed up in London, got to go down to a basement, said, I'm here for the Kubrick archives. And they ushered me into a gigantic warehouse and... Um, filled with boxes and said, what movies do you want to see uh, the information from? And I was like, uh, Killer's Kiss and Eyes Wide Shut. Let's start with the beginning and end of his career. And they brought me like 15 boxes and a, and a glass of like, or a box of like white gloves. And, uh, and they left me alone for like 10 hours. 
That is a lot of trust for someone they don't uh-huh, know. Uh-huh. No, I, I oh absolutely my God. I absolutely conned my way into the Kubrick archives. Oh, and, and that person could have so easily been fired. Oh, like I mean, like I just I could have so easily stolen things. I got to hold film in my hand that Kubrick shot. I got to look at Eyes Wide Shut's script, like the first draft with all of his handwritten notes in it. Um I got to, to hold stock certificates that he had sold to me. Guys, this episode companies. is going to be about a completely different yeah, thing. Yeah, no, it, was, <laughs> it was one of the best cons I can't, that I can't believe. Like, it was like Ocean's Eleven, but it was I can't just believe me. I it so stupid. Like, <laughs> hey, hi, can I come in here? Sure, why not? What could go wrong? Literally anything, but why not? Here, let us show you all of our diamonds. Mm-hmm. Yes, no, that is, that is, I basically called up Fort Knox and said, I'd like to see your gold exhibit, sir. And they were like, absolutely, sir. Right huh. this way. If and you don't mind, I'm going to go on my lunch break. Mm-hmm. Yep. You and know, just lock up when you're done. You're sure you're not a criminal. You are correct, sir. I am not a criminal. It's like when the teacher left you alone in your classroom. <laughs> this is... Yes. This is absolutely Ken true. Ken just told me this story, this story today, and it is just priceless. It is, yeah. Um, long story. I will make this incredibly short because this is not a podcast. I know. Me in, I know. In, in high school. Um, uh, I got left in my school teacher's room uh, during lunchtime. I was fixing something that had broken, and she had to go to a meeting, and she said... Basically lock the door behind you. And then she left. And I realized, well, this is an opportunity I should not pass up. So I turned my teacher's classroom entirely 90 directions to the uh, the left. And uh, made sure that everything was fully functional. It's just everything was in a different direction now. And um, let's just say, because of the kind words of a teacher, I I only merely got detention and was not suspended. uh, Mainly because it was pretty funny. (laughs) <laughs> and uh, so that's um, one teacher was no nonsense. The other one was yep. So this is yeah. This like, is he he objectively likes you because he let you have access to all of your. It things. was a functional classroom. Yes, you could get to every drawer. Like the the chairs were all in the right spot. It just was a different direction now. So yes, this is this is now two in quotes crimes. I have already committed. Uh, I have already uh, <laughs> uh, copped to God, on this uh, very crime filled. Uh, podcast that we're talking about today. Well, if I own, a, if I owe a lot of money to a loan shark, um, I'm coming to you to plan the next heist because it'll be the easiest heist apparently that will ever have to be committed. It'd be like uncut gems, but just very silly and much less <laughs> stressful. Ah, uh, so yeah, so back to it. the The film that we are talking about, Tigers Are Not Afraid. The uh, Spanish uh, title is actually uh, Vulven. Yes, Vulven. They return. Yes. Oh, they return. Yes. I also saw come back as a another option on that translation. Yes. So, yeah. And this was also written by Issa Lopez, the director, um, who has this uh, to this day directed four of her the 11 films that she has wrote. Um, her story is very interesting. Um, you know, born in Mexico City, she originally um, wanted to pursue archaeology. Oh, okay. And she went on that path for two years, and then she switched over to filmmaking. Uh, she got her start writing, producing, directing romantic comedies, not necessarily because she wanted to, but because she was forced into that genre as a female filmmaker. And there is a really, I, I highly urge everyone to go onto YouTube and look up the interview um, with her and Guillermo del Toro. Because it is, for one thing, it is delightful. She is a delightful person, and so is Guillermo. Um, and one of the things she talks about is, and especially in, in Mexico, where the gender roles are very, are much more cemented, and there is a way that things are usually done uh, from a gender standpoint. And in her way, her way of saying is like, oh yeah, no, pretty much, um, you know, I, my first two hit films were romantic comedies, not because I wanted to do them, but because I pretty much had to, because, you know, women, they only really like to write light, floaty things or, or real musical things and just, just, just floating with, just seething with sarcasm the whole time. And it's fucking hilarious. But then she talked about how, uh, she wanted to get out of that. And so what she did was she started, she had a lot of experience writing the romantic comedies and she wanted to get more experience writing something else. So to do that, she would wake up super early in the morning and she was not a morning person at all. And what she would do is she would then at least write uh, an entire scene in the morning. Um, And the reason why she did it early in the morning was because it allowed her to write from a dream state. Interesting, okay. Yeah. And so then what she did was when she finished uh, her first draft of um, Tigers Are Not Afraid, she brought it to her producer who she she didn't have a contractual agreement with him. It was more of a a handshake agreement with him. 
and pretty much said, I would like to do this film, will you give me money for it? To which he's like, this isn't really what we were thinking of. Uh, we were thinking you'd do another romantic comedy. She's like, okay, here's the thing. You give me money for this movie, or I take this script to another producer. Whether he makes it or not is not the point. What I'm also bringing to that producer is all of my other scripts. And at that point, it's just like, okay, so long as you do not leave us, we will give you money to make this film. And then she made the film, and then they're like, oh, oh, you're, you're really good at this. And then Guillermo del Toro came in and said, she's mine. And now she's doing a werewolf western with Guillermo del Toro oh, that, nice. has, that has yet to be titled. Um, it's completely finished pre-production. But COVID, you know, like the bitch that it is, as, has yeah, interrupted shut it process. all down. Yeah. And she said that she is basing this werewolf film off of one of her favorite films, Ginger Snaps. Oh, good. So, you know, she is one of us. Mm-hmm, absolutely. Um, but yes, no, this, this was a film that I, I sort of watched on a whim. It was sort of the kind of film you, you watch drawn in by the poster. I didn't know anything about the director at the time. Didn't there's no, you know, heavy actors in there. All the yeah. kids that she cast actually she cast kids specifically that weren't actors. Yeah. Because one of the reasons she did this was because you know, one of the things that everyone watches in Mexico are telenovelas. Um it's just something you have on in the background, something you you watch after dinner, whatnot. And so there's a very specific way that people talk in telenovelas. They have to talk like this, very low. And over dramatic. And she would find that a lot of the kids that came in who had acting careers already, they just talked like that. It's 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 a theater kid thing where yeah. there's gonna be like there's gonna be the way the kids who are raised up to perform are going to perform in a very certain way and are very likely going to be uh, we like they're going to have a very affected tone because like they have always learned to consider the way that they are presenting what they're doing. Everything is considered mm-hmm. with a theater kid, and yeah, you're gonna absolutely lose that naturalism. There was a, there's a couple of movies that I really thought of when I was watching this that aren't necessarily horror movies. Um, one I would say borders on horror movie, but. Uh, the movies The Florida Project, Kids, and Gummo were all three movies that I thought about here that did uh, a really great job of portraying accurately what street life is for kids who are like this. Or so it's the, the the escapism of street kids, pretty well, much. It, well, just like a the raw reality of what that's like. Like it's the difference between like the little rascals. And what a bunch of orphan kids are actually like. All three of these movies, or sorry, all four of these movies, do a great job of showing you, like, well, no, like, it's really great because the kids can live in this world of imagination and run around. And they have all this freedom. But also that lack of freedom comes with, like, they're cold, or they don't have food, or, mm-hmm. or like, they, they have to escape in this certain way because everyday life is so bad and... All of these movies are very upfront about both the the positives and the negatives mm-hmm. that come with that kind of freedom. Yeah, and that's what it feels like as a kid. Like honestly, it's it's neglect and these people not having uh, people to take care of them or provide them with basic comforts because of a trillion reasons. Yeah, but they're at least this... honest about how hard it is. Yeah, and this one. The reason why they are orphaned, it, it, this this heavily addresses the issue that Mexico has been having, in which and in this inter- the interview with Guillermo del Toro, she talks about, she thinks that this film has unfortunately become even more prominent, and not for good reasons, it's because the situation in Mex- Mexico just continues to get worse and worse and worse, and it doesn't seem like there's an, there's really a way out of it, but it's just the idea of, like, when the film opens, it says over 200,000 people thus far within this, or within this period of time, have died uh, due to the drug war happening in Mexico. Um, you know, people are either kidnapped off the street, uh, they're trafficked, they're, they're murdered, they're, but either way, like, every person that dies leaves somebody behind. Most of the time, it's a child. And there is no program, necessarily, or no effective program that can house and take care of all these children. And or so just track them, or just... 
create yeah. statistics that are accurate. Yeah, an issue that we're having right now in the States with these kids and families that are currently trying to come over fleeing this sort of issue. And she's, this is a, an issue that she's very, very passionate about and says that is, is highly overlooked by Mexican middle class and upper class. She's like, like, the, all the, like what you see in a lot of that culture is you see a lot of, um, um, what's, what's the word I'm looking for? Like where they, they, they almost praising cartels or grandize, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, uh, yeah, no, praising them or they, they look up to them a certain way. I mean, the, re- the reason that organized crime most of the time moves into a city is because that there is some sort of, something that the justice system or the government cannot provide. Whether yeah. it's security or justice for things that have gone wrong. If you look at the history of the mafia, the reason that organized crime moved in is because the Italian government was incredibly weak. And like, when you just need comeuppance or just justice, yeah, it's very easy in the if there's nothing else to turn to to turn to organized crime. I know a lot of uh, the accuser is is kind of seen in that way as well as kind of like this a necessary evil, a thing that's like, well, you know, you don't use the yakuza just all willy nilly, but I'm glad we have it because you know, like they when were that a thing li- happened to your sister. It was good that we had that guy who broke that yeah. guy's meat. Well, if you watch the documentary Cartel Land, which I recently um, checked out and is a powerful one that I highly recommend, it, it tells the story of um, this group of village elders in um, Mishogan, I think is how it's pronounced. I, I do apologize because I'm going to completely obliterate all these names and not pronounce them the right way. I'm going to try. Um, but I am a random white dude talking about the struggles of... A minority group that he knows very little about, um, but you know he tells the perspective of the village elders who say we're done with these cartels. They have made life absolutely miserable. They have they have hurt us in so many different ways. We're going to get together. We're going to push them out by force because the government's not doing anything. And by the end of the documentary, um, it has become a case of divide and conquer, where pretty much the government that is pretty in deep with the cartels is telling them lay down your arms. And after, like, taking over a couple of cities, they're stretched too thin, and there's infighting, and then one of the other guys takes a deal with the government, and they make him head of this department, and he's just as crooked now. And then the guy who started it all turns out he cheats on his wife a whole bunch, and even after, like, an assassination attempt, he just kind of gives up and goes into hiding. And now I think he's actually in jail now. Um, I think he's in Mexican. I think he's in a Mexican prison. Um, but yeah, it just goes to show that like it, this is something that's very hard to combat by the government, especially if it's a weak government. And she makes a good point in this by saying, the thing that you can do with this type of film that you can't do in the States, it's a lot easier to ask um, if this movie was made in the States, it's a lot easier to ask, well, why didn't they just go to the cops? That reason is very obvious yeah, in this they, film. They literally do. And those cops are like, oh, absolutely not. Yes. They, they show this little piece of evidence to the cops, thinking like the cops will help us, they'll do something about it. And then, yeah, they look at it and they just go, hey, isn't that, oh, fuck no. And they just, they literally yeah. drive they away. Just, yeah, just hard pass, kids. Hard Sorry. pass. Like, we're going to go ahead and say we never saw this. That was, that's not our problem. And do you know what? Um, I, I, we will be, we're, we're going to be driving very fast in the direction that is the opposite of you because. Yeah. Nope. So yeah, so it's this this director. This was a story that she desperately wanted to tell. Um, she at the beginning didn't necessarily know how she wanted to tell it, and made a lot of different changes once they got into the production phase, which is where she says writing really starts. I I mean I the, the there's a lot of examples in this movie of this director clearly using everything at her disposal, leaning into every. Every single thing that would make this movie a problem to make, she leans into and takes advantage of. Mm-hmm. Every story beat that could make this seemingly small, she takes advantage of to make the characters deeper. This is, I believe, an incredibly well-directed and well-made movie. It is a real great example of sort of that philosophy of using every part of the buffalo. Not being like, oh, well, we can only shoot in these favelas, so... You know, we can only tell this kind of story. Yeah, no. Flavellas look dope. Mm-hmm. Like, you just need to know when to shoot and where to shoot and how to shoot them. And you need to have a story that isn't apologizing for them. It's leaning into them. And this movie is definitely that. Now, that said, I 
I did not particularly enjoy this movie. Mm -hmm. But that said, I do not want anyone to think that I am saying in any way, shape, or form that this is a bad movie. Yeah, you, I, you, you're, yeah your reasons behind this are very specific to you. What, yes, a huge amount of this is everything that's on my side of the table. I've said this before on the podcast, and I'll say it again. I do not like ghost stories. I, I don't like them specifically because for most so for most movies with stakes to work there needs to be very hard and fast rules those rules can be bent or altered or announced by the filmmaker they can vary from genre to genre from film to film from franchise to franchise from movies in the franchise to other movies in the franchise, but they need to be consistent with their own rules. And I find most of the time with ghost stories, you find yourself... Uh, most movies end up breaking their own ghost rules to tell their ghost stories. And I don't particularly like that. But I will 100% admit, all of that is problems that are on my side of the table. A good example of it would be, um, I know someone who likes their bacon borderline burnt, like the most crispy, like just, just hard, shattery, charcoaly. I do not understand bacon. And, and yeah, I, I do not understand it. However, if you asked a cook, is this well done bacon? They would say yes. That is exactly well done bacon. That is. 100% the textbook of well-done bacon. If a person asks for well-done bacon, you should cook it like that. And my response to that is, but that's ruining the bacon. That makes the bacon taste bad. But not to the people who like their bacon like that. Mm -hmm. And that, that doesn't make the bacon bad. That means I don't like the bacon cooked that way. And that is more of the problem I had with this movie was, for me personally, I am not a ghost story fan I am not a fan of uh, movies that have a villain who has I don't even want to say wishy-washy powers just not well-defined rules of how things are going to play out because when you don't have that for me personally I have a hard time anticipating what's going to happen and with that lack of anticipation for me uh, comes a lack of suspense. But I 100% will admit those problems are on my side of the table, not with the film, because I think this movie is very well lensed. I think it's very well edited. I think the performances out of the kids are fantastic. I think the casting is great. I love the camera work. I don't have any problems with it moment to moment. I just... Well, as Jimmy Carr once said... There's a really easy way to tell if your house is haunted. It's not. Grow up. <laughs> and that to me is... And, like, and that's why I'm saying the problem is on my side of the table. Yeah. Because like that's not the movie's fault. There are plenty of people... Like, it's... Yeah, I think, I think I offered this one to you because to me I didn't necessarily see it fully as a ghost story. I saw it more as a fairy tale horror, uh, horror flick. Like I... I um... I think like this film is described as a crime fantasy horror film that plays like a Peter Pan Lost Boys fairy tale. I think that's the best way that I can describe it. That's not too far off. It's um because Shiny is definitely Peter Estrella is is uh she's she is definitely Wendy. And then the boys are the Lost Boys. Th there is a what a so so all right. With this movie, there is an interesting mix of whimsy with hard drama. There are, like, kids who are homeless living in an encampment, but also a plush tiger that comes away, like, alive and definitely, like, dances around and talks to the kids and, like... Does its whole shtick. Graffiti that comes to life. Exactly. There is there's a really fascinating mix of magical realism and hard realism in this movie yeah. that I have not seen in a lot of other films. And that's, again, why I'm saying like the movie for me didn't necessarily work super well. But 
also, as we were talking about before, it's not a movie that's supposed to make you feel good. It's it's like talking it's it's like saying, Well, Schindler's List isn't as good of a movie as Jaws because I didn't have a good time when I watched Schindler's List. Yeah, no shit. <laughs> It's Schindler's List. You had a good time watching Schindler's yeah. List. I think you got some issues you got yeah. to work out. It's supposed to make you feel... It's, it's like saying, oh man, the ending of King Lear was a super big bummer. Yep. yep. Yeah. It's a tragedy. The, uh, Guillermo del Toro, and the, once again, I, I'm urging everyone to watch this interview because it's wonderful. Guillermo del Toro is like... He, he always says, like, the films that wake you up are usually the films that put you to sleep. Mm-hmm. And I thought, it was like that is a very good way to put it. Because, um, yeah, it, it, like... Oftentimes, when you're going to watch a movie that really want like, when you watch a movie that makes you have to look internally or really take a deep dive in what something means, you know, it's not escapism. It, like, like you're, you're doing some mental homework. Or, or it's the kind of a movie that can lull you into a sense of safety just to stick the knife in as hard as it possibly can. Yeah. Sometimes that's the most impactful kind of a movie. A movie that, that, that lulls you into a dreamlike state that makes you, whatever the opposite of a fugue state is, when you're just kind of vibing with the movie, and then all of a sudden a filmmaker just kind of comes around the corner and just like shanks you with yeah. this just emotional knife right underneath your rib cage. That's... Um, one of the funniest stories I ever heard was someone who was at the premiere of Seven. And, <laughs> oh boy. And someone walked up to <laughs> David Fincher and shook his hand and said, Thanks, man. Your movie made me really feel like shit. <laughs> and I don't know if that's true or not. But I can't think of anything funnier or more accurate than like, Yeah, what do you say at the end of Seven? Oh man, I really feel like shit. But like, that's such an accomplishment. But also, good job. What else do you say? Oh man, thanks. Yeah, it's like it was the Which, it, like I was told it was the worst after party in the history of Hollywood. Just like a bunch of people shuffling around with beers, not talking to each other, not making eye contact because like they just watched Seven for the first time. Which is it's crazy because like she like she brings up a list of the things that she's based this movie off of, and they weren't even upset that it was just because Kevin Spacey was in it. <laughs> oh yeah, Kevin Spacey wasn't Kevin Spacey yet. Yeah, no, he, hadn't been he was by... just Kevin Spacey. He was just that guy waiting to be replaced yeah. by Christopher Plummer. He was the guy where like I remember there was a period of time with Kevin Spacey where all he played were serial killers or crazy people. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and now he just plays serial abusers. You know, and now he doesn't play anybody at all. Well, yeah, now he doesn't do anything. <laughs> at all, so. Oh, fuck you, Kevin Spacey! Yeah, not I, I, of the I, show, Kevin Spacey. I hate you for being good and then being a terrible person. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, no, like, like it's crazy though because she she based this movie off of some things that you don't necessarily you, you when you hear it you're like yeah that makes sense like she based it off of like Goonies, um, she based it off of Twelve Monkeys, Peter Pan, but she also based it off of Monkey's Paw, having never read Monkey's Paw, but her her father would whenever like he was a professor and like whenever they had to stay at these hotels like these really shitty hotels and they couldn't fall asleep and so he would tell them the tale of the monkey's paw and that's where she never to this day has not read it and even during the interview she's like I really should read it one day <laughs> it's like I, once again like she is charming like she's one of those people like, like you are filled with class and you are funny as fuck. I get the feeling if you're going to be a woman in Mexico who's a director who's then going to get the chance to go ahead and do this, you're going to actually have to be really talented and really charming because otherwise they're just going to tell yeah. you no because the patriarchy sucks. On her first film, uh, to get the cooperation of the men for her first film, because, you know, she's heading this off. And, and once again, like in Mexico, there is a very heavy gender role specific yeah. way that life is supposed to be out there. Um, and so to get the co- the cooperation of the men on her crew, uh, she tricked them into thinking that she actually needed them. So she would go, be, like, she would literally just go to whatever guy she needed to get his trust. And she's like, hey, can you show me how to do this? Or can you show me how this works? Knowing full well she fucking knew how that worked. But she just, like, she knows, like, these men need their ego stroked. Mm-hmm. They need to think that I need them. And then by the end of the point, then they're just like, like, then it's sort of been like, oh yeah, we fucking die for this woman. Like, she needs us. And then she's like, I don't need you. Yeah. But sure, I'll keep you around. It's, it's, I mean, that's, but like, that's what directing is. Directing is not, 
the job, like, it is very easy to direct. When you have hired Meryl Streep, everything has gone fine, and you can throw money at any problem. You are a director. When Meryl Streep is on her fifth day of cocaine, will not come out of her trailer because she does not like her outfit, uh, the, co the set that you are shooting on was supposed to be a three-wall set and is now a one-and-a-half wall set because of a small fire that may or may not have been one of your grips problems. And, uh, and on top of it, you have to get through six pages today, even though you only really have time for three. That's when you're directing. This is directing. Di yeah. I, I learned more about directing from being a Boy Scout camp counselor and teaching a bunch of 14-year-olds both how to use knives safely and how to light fires without cutting themselves or make fires that I didn't want them to make. That was far more valuable than most of what I learned in film school. Mm -hmm. A lot of film school was a lot of like, that's a really nice idea about symbolism. She was also smart enough to get the Wrangler from City of God. Like the child wrangler oh. from City of God. Okay. Uh, well, <laughs> She hired the child yeah. wrangler, whose name is Fatima. Yeah, uh, she... no, yeah that's when you find out that Wes Anderson's uh, production designer also happened to work for a little guy named Stanley Kubrick. And you're like, <laughs> oh, of course his movies look good. He just worked for Stanley Kubrick. <laughs> it's, yeah, if you go get the guy who cast City of God... Yeah, your kid actors are going to be pretty good. But Have she also, like, well, she recognized talent because she brought this Wrangler on. And, like, she'd worked on this film and she knew what she was fucking doing. But then she left halfway through production and she kind of panicked. And she's like, no. The Wrangler I, left. The Wrangler left. And she's like, no, I left on purpose because you can totally wrangle these kids. Um, she helped her learn to establish trust with each of the kids. And the idea of, like, like hey, like, kids aren't like grown-ups in the sense that they take things far more literally. So when you want a kid to be afraid, you need to show them fear. Like, you, you have to, like, really... And like, and, but at the same time, you need to, like... It's all about gaining their trust. Once they trust you, they will fucking do anything for you. It, it seems like... So when you're working with another adult actor, there is, a, there is an agreement made between two adults that, like... Hey, we both agree that this is, like, theater, right? Like... Like, I remember a, a story I heard about Guy Pierce, where uh, the director pulled one of his co-actors aside and was basically like, hey, so this take, go really big and crazy and, like, really get in Guy's face. I know that's not part of the scene, but, like, I just want that reaction from him. And so director said action, and the other actor freaked out and totally got in Guy's face. And Guy Pierce then, after they said cut, was like, Hey, can we talk for a quick second? And pulled the director aside and was like, Hey man, like I do this for a living. Um, if you want me to go bigger or something, you can just tell me. You don't have to do all these tricks and stuff. Because like I'm an, an adult who's a professional who does this for money. So if you that could poor just... poor actor. Well like, <laughs> well, like that's... I mean, like that... This is Guy Pierce talking to the director. He's not... Chastising the other actor. Oh yeah, I He's know. Chastising the director. The other actor just did exactly what he was told to do, and I think Guy Pierce knew that and probably didn't take it out of him uh, uh, as a result. God, I hope not. But it's but with a kid, you kind of have to be in the scene. Kid actors can be some of the best actors, the most invested, the most real, the most actually in a scene reacting to the actual emotions that are being created by the other person's performance. I got to work with Jason Isaacs and watching him work with a child actor was incredible because you would watch him oscillate between getting very intense and bringing in anger or an intensity to a certain scene to get the response out of the actress and then as soon as they call cut he'd be like I am so sorry no I didn't know I just yelled because I'm a big ol I'm just trying to get the thing out of you and it's fun and we're all friends and it's just acting but in those moments despite the fact that a lot of those times he wasn't on screen he was doing that thing where the other actor is acting just for the other actor they're just providing them coverage for like their single for their 
uh, their close up for their medium. And so most of the time, and actually a lot of times, if you have a big star who's in that role, that person's not there saying that scene. They're not doing that with that person. It's usually like a, a script supervisor who a lot of times are encouraged to not act. They are like, D -d don't try and be in a scene with Jack Nicholson. Let Jack Nicholson do whatever he wants. And your job is to read the lines. You, you hire Jack Nicholson to be Jack Nicholson. Just like you, you don't but act with Nicholas Cage. And your you let job Nicolas Cage as a act. script supervisor is not to try and be in the scene with them. Your job is to provide them the prompts for them to do the thing that they are paid millions of dollars to do. Mm -hmm. So it becomes a very weird situation where like, you might want to act. Yeah. But you're not supposed to. But with kids, you kind of can't do that. If you hear about the stories of Spielberg directing uh, Close Encounters of the Third Kind, to get the performance out of the little kid, he built like a, a, like a gigantic series of blankets and flags with masks and various doodads that he could like pop out from a corner with a gorilla mask and be all spooky and then like hide back and then pop out with some toys and then hide back and pop out. And that's how he was able to get this incredible performance out of the little kid where he's like looking at, looking at things in wonder and then he's following this and then he's a little spooked and then he's a little scared, but he's still a little excited. <laughs> and it's this whole, and, but those are two completely different, like the way that you work with Meryl Streep is you get out of the way. Yeah. And the way that you work with kids is you need them like tiny pieces of clay and you, and, and, and you have to realize that like also the clay is going to push back. It is not a job of manipulation. It is a job of, uh, oh God, what's, what's the, like it is about, it is about nourishing. It is about creating an environment for them to be able to be the free creative people that kids can be in a way that adults yeah. can. And these kids did a spectacular oh. job. Like so good. The, um, uh, and I'm, I'm looking. I'm looking up the names of um, of this cast. It's unfortunately because they don't. They don't. They haven't done a lot of work. There's no pictures next to their name in IMDb. Um, but well, much like City of God is the kind of the same way. None yeah. of those, no, to the they, best of my is, knowledge, they, almost none of those people went on to like a big career. Yeah, I think uh, Paola Laura, who played Estrella, I think she's the only one that's kind of gone on and done more work. Okay, and I think she'd actually been one of the few to have done work before this. And that was specifically because the director wanted somebody who maybe like had been on set before because she kind of wanted a little bit of a princess out of her because she knew that the boys would be boys and they would kind of reject her and make her feel... Which is sort of what the role calls for. Because the boys have been homeless and she comes home to find that her mother is not yes. home and will never come home because the cartels have taken her. And so now, eventually, she stayed home waiting long enough, and now she's hungry. And the only people she's had interactions with recently have been these kids. And they are small child boys who think girls are gross. And, they're, and kids are fucking cruel and mean. And so, they, like, the roles were perfectly assigned. And these kids didn't... She wanted to cast kids, to, like, based on their energy. Um, and I know that sounds super hippy-dippy, but it, it's one of those things where... It fucking worked great, especially for the uh, for Shiny, who was the best casting advice I ever got from a casting director was always remember to cast for the person, like cast the actor for the role that they become and not for the role that they are, because that way the truth of the actor and their character mm -hmm. will become more true as the movie goes on. Yeah, if the person like if it, like it makes sense. To cast Tom Hanks. You could cast Tom Hanks as a piece of shit. Who becomes a super good guy. Because Tom Hanks is a super good guy. So him becoming a super good guy. Uh, I'll give you a great example. Real Steel. Totally works. Because Hugh Jackman. Despite the fact that he's friends with Ivanka and Jared. And we'll get into that at another point. But. He is genuinely a good guy from every story that I have heard. And the story of him becoming, going from a shitty dad who left his kid behind to a pretty good guy who cares about his kid. Yeah, that's moving towards the truth of what Hugh Jackman is. 
casting Hugh Jackman as like a dude who starts to beat his wife or doesn't like his kid just doesn't work for Hugh Jackman. That's that's like Robert De Niro or Steve Buscemi or I am not to say that those people beat their kids, but like they don't come off as like inherently positive. They they come off as flawed. They come off as they have problems. They they come off as complex individuals, and so. Mm-hmm. You want to cast them as characters who become more flawed as opposed to characters who become... Uh, or, or the characters who benefit, dramatically speaking, from being less than flawed. Like in Real Steel. Like, we want to see Hugh Jackman as, like, a dad who's a little mean here and there. But, like, you don't want to see Hugh Jackman in Real Steel where, like, he slaps his kid around. No, no, no. No. I want to see him... Be mad that he has to make mashed potatoes. Like, or like, oh man, I gotta change this tire on this truck that I... I gotta called. change a diaper? Well, that I... Oh, have, yeah. Or like, yeah, I have to change the tire on this ro- uh, truck that I drive a robot around in that we had fight, but it's not... It's not... He doesn't like... Lo- like, they don't lose the robot He's fight. ornery. Well, like, yeah, it, it's... It's he's, a, he's a curmudgeon. Yeah, he doesn't lose the robot fight and then go home and beat his kid. It's no. like, no, he loses no. the robot fight and then like... He might be a semi-heavy drinker, but he's not a blackout heavy yeah. drinker. Yeah, he's, he's an alcoholic in that he's way. He's in the that, opening like, scene where like the kid comes to get his help, but he's just a little hungover. He's, he's like, just oh, little, I don't want to deal yeah, with you, kid. I'm sad. Uh, you know why? Because I'm on a bench. Like it's that, <laughs> it's like that kind of sad where you're like yeah no you're just sitting on a bench it's not really that bad and you're like no no if this I was bench is really if I was fine I would be sitting in a chair and this is a bench that I'm sitting here like a crazy homeless person I got like, splinters in my ass yeah and you're like well, Jesus Christ what are you talking about like you're just sitting on a bench it's just a park it's not that bad I feel like Man. that's how Hugh Jackman acts whenever he sits on a bench probably I I, oh, I don't want to be on this bench yeah, he might be allergic to wood God if I'm only knows. Yeah, um, but yeah, no. It's um, I, I, it was, it's one of those cases where I really appreciate everything that this filmmaker was able to accomplish. I also just like that she was somebody who took risks during the filming. Um, they didn't necessarily, yeah, they didn't necessarily feel that the way that she was setting up the shots was working, but she decided to go along with it um, because, for one thing, her cinematographer was adamant that this would work. Um, she, uh, in the visuals, she decided to make the camera extra jumpy and keep the angles low and always hiding behind something because she wanted to stay true to the idea that the camera is the sixth child and that there has always been another child watching with them just observing the fucking world, which is what kids do. They, they, a kid's job is pretty much to observe and take in everything. Absolutely. Um, and so yeah, and, and just uh, and we're coming up towards the end, so we're going to start wrapping things up a little bit here. Uh, but just a, a couple of small little tidbits that I found fascinating about this film was that originally tigers were not in this film at all, or okay. had nothing to do with it. Um, oh gosh, um, yeah. So she, how she put it was that yeah, there were no originally tigers were nowhere in the script, so there was supposed to be a scene where Shiny sees a zebra. And okay. then he has a real connective moment with the zebra, and it walks away. And it was a real connective moment that she felt passionately about. And so she sent productions like, we need a zebra. We have to have a zebra. And they went to go, production went to go find a zebra. They're like, this place we went to, they don't have zebras. They have a hippo. And she goes, I don't think that's going to convey what we're going for. Could you go back and see what else they have? They come back, still no zebras. They have tigers. And then from that, she's like, okay, well, stripes, it's, okay. So yeah, it's no, just I like, think stripes, it's like stripes like a cage. And, and he's just like, and then she started like working out and she goes, and then she literally disappeared for an entire day and rewrote large portions of the script and then also changed the title of the script to Tigers Are Not Afraid. Um, and then, of course, happened across a tiger plushie, which now she also wants to make it a thing where. They sell as many of those plushies as possible and donate the money to homeless children in Mexico. Oh, yeah, that's nice. um, but yeah, so it could have it, it could have just as easily been hippos are not afraid, which is bullshit because hippos are 
Hippos are absolutely Hippo, not Hippos are not afraid of shit. Fun fact, uh, the number one animal to murder people in the continent of Africa is 100% hippos. Yeah. Mostly because... I believe it. Yeah, mostly because people are like, look at those gigantic 2,000 pound animals. Whatever could it do to me? And the answer is... Everything. Swim like 30 miles per hour, trample you to death because it weighs 2,000 pounds. And then also, have you seen how big its teeth are? I know they're not sharp, but like... There's, there's. Have par- you seen how big they are? They're there's, like as big as your femur. I think it's, I think it's Argentina, but there, there's one specific country that has an invasive species problem, and that invasive species is hippos. Oh, um, it is, um, uh, uh what is it? it? It is because specifically of, um, uh, rich it, people. I'm no, guessing. no, no, not, 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 not just rich people. Um, what's the, the incredibly famous, um, Pablo Escobar? He had on his compound a bunch of hippos. And yes. Then after yes. he got arrested, they made their way into the ecosystem, and now they have an epidemic of hippos. What a weird thing to have! An yeah, epidemic no, of. the weirdest one of the like, the, like, like man. It's not like they're easy to round up, and I don't even. It's not even appropriate to call it white people problems because Pablo Escobar started it, but it's definitely <laughs> rich people problems. Which uh, interesting thing? Um, a lot of the cartels got a lot of their meth cooking um, from literally a father and son from the United States Aww. who came in and taught them the chemistry. Aww. You know, Walter White style. Mm-hmm. And just so, yeah. son. so, so you Walt know, Jr. so I, I'm not saying that a lot of many countries' problems are caused by America, but oh, all, but they are, but they are, mm-hmm. they, 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 they absolutely are. So yeah, so, so sort of uh, as we're coming down on this, and we get towards uh, me handing the reins over to Ken here. Um, I definitely, you know, while this might not necessarily been your cup of tea, um, I still highly recommend this to anybody who can. Oh, like, and I would let me be clear. I like this movie. If you like horror movies and ghost stories, and if you like independent cinema, if you like... If you like Guillermo del Toro, you will like like, this movie. If you like Mexican cinema, if you like stories about kids, you are going to like this movie. I personally did not like this movie, and that is the problems on my side of the table. Um, Me saying I did not like this is like saying... That a uh, a deep fried Twinkie is not good for you, no shit. Like that's not what this is about. This is I'm not arguing this movie isn't good to see. Mm-hmm. I'm saying I did not personally like it because I personally don't like ghost stories. But that is also like saying I don't like spicy food. So this I don't like this chorizo. Well, okay, but yeah. a we could just make less spicy chorizo, and also. Well, it's spicy sausage, so I don't know if you don't if you don't like spicy stuff. I don't think you're ever gonna like spicy sausage. Yeah. If you don't like chilies, you're not gonna like chilies. If you don't like yeah, if you don't like balsamic vinegar, like if you don't like tomatoes, there's a lot of Italian food you're not gonna like. I am lactose intolerant. There is a whole lot of Italian food that I just cannot eat because it makes me really sick because I cannot eat milk. Doesn't mean it ain't good. But yeah, but it, I would never tell an Italian person, <laughs> hey. This food you know is that, shitted. Yeah, you know that mozzarella that you make? Pretty bad. On the can. Ours. Yeah. No, that's not the mozzarella. The chef would be more like, that sounds like a you problem. Yeah, exactly. It is a 100% me problem. Not at all a this movie yeah. problem. I, the, this is a really solidly yeah. made movie. For And for a $1.3 million budget that was shot in 30 days. Oh, then yeah. Then, yeah, like, double so. Like, very impressive. So, yes, I highly recommend that you guys check out Tigers Are Not Afraid, directed by uh, Issa Lopez. So, yes, please, give it a look. It is on Shudder. It is a Shudder exclusive. So, Shudder, please, uh, you know, maybe sponsor us and give us a little bit of money and a free membership. Uh, but with that said, Ken, I remove the hosting crown. Thank you. And I hand it to you. All right. Well, that means it's time for us to pull up the time machine, and it's time for us to travel in time. Sorry, I had to tuck away in the corner and here. We are going to watch two trailers. We're going to watch one that we have already seen, but we're going to watch it again because I am insisting. God damn it, David! We are going to watch this movie sooner or later. Mm-hmm. And the other movie, actually, I have not seen before, but oh. it is one of those movies that I have been hearing about for an awfully long time and it keeps popping up on my shutter stream and i have not seen it either i also know for a fact that it is a movie that inspired a recent 
what I'm told is very, very good horror film uh, from 2020, uh, The Stylist, which I'm very interested in seeing, and from what I understand is going to be coming to, I believe it's Arrow? And I, what the fuck is Arrow? Arrow is a uh, DVD distribution company. Uh, where they make special edition Blu-rays and DVDs oh, of uh, oh. particular horror films, and they are very good about making sure. I, I live in the stream verse yes, now. No, everything um, is... so, so there are different. So, like um, Twilight Time is a great company that puts out great transfers of older films. However, most of the time they don't include a lot of uh, additional commentaries or booklets or essays or. Or additional information about the movies themselves. Most of the time, with twi- with a Twilight Time release, you're going to get whatever special features were available beforehand, and maybe one or two small things. Twilight Time, or sorry, not Twilight Time, Arrow. Way to embarrass myself there, Ken. Uh, Arrow, on the other hand, um, kind of like Criterion Collection, tends to put out a ton of extras, a couple of commentaries, a couple of essays, a couple of making ofs, a couple of interviews, and. An Arrow release is almost always a great way of knowing that you're going to get a definitive release of a classic yeah. film. Tigers Are Not Afraid has a really good um, uh, metal case edition with commentaries. Steelbook? and yeah, a st- yeah, sorry, Steelbook. Um, they have a really good Steelbook uh, Blu-ray release that I, I've, I've looked into. Part of me kind of wants to get it, but I, I don't subscribe necessarily to physical nearly as much as you do because... Money is in space mostly. Well, I mean, it's also one of those like if you you can, it's very easy to spend the money on uh, getting a non physical digital copy, which is great when that digital copy is still works, and is also great when you are dealing with moving. However, there are certain movies, there are certain titles that just are going to end up falling through the cracks, that are going to end up falling by the wayside. One of the great things about a uh, service like Shudder is it brings to the horror community these titles that a lot of times probably wouldn't get the attention. There's, there's a that they lot of would. like very obscure films, and, and a lot of them we've covered here on this show too. Absolutely. However, if something were to happen to Shudder, mm, yeah, yeah. then movies like Tigers Are Not Afraid are the kinds of movies that very easily could disappear because they were a Shutter exclusive. As a result, they did not get a large DVD or Blu-ray, uh, Blu-ray printing. As a result, there are just not that many copies out there. And then if something happens, it's very easy sometimes for those properties to just drift away. FX, owned by Fox which is owned by Disney, has an amazing series called Terriers, which has never been released on DVD or Blu-ray. And so the only way to literally watch it is, I guess, if you have Emmy or uh, Golden Globe streams, like, or sorry, not streams, but like a physical copy from when... I mean, like a Canadian VPN... Well, like, well, just just because you were part of SAG and you were able to get screeners for TV stuff, then, or, it's got to be streaming. It's yeah. just not available. Um, Atlanta, Donald Glover's show, is only available for made-to-print Amazon really? DVD. There's no Blu-ray, and most people probably don't know this, but there are two ways that you can get your movie on Amazon. One is you essentially pay to rent a small amount of square footage in an Amazon warehouse where you then store your DVDs of your movie that you sell. And you make as much money off of the difference between the profit and what you paid for those DVDs and Amazon takes care of all the just shipping. The other option is you upload your movie to Amazon and you upload the cover And then it is basically a made-to-print mail service. You never have a giant spot in the warehouse where all of your DVDs are. You just pay, say, like, you basically allow Amazon to sell for however much they sell the DVD for. The difference between them customly printing a box, a cover, and your DVD. It's just the cost of material and... Yep, 
And okay. then they, they do all the printing. So you never have more copies than you sold. Yeah. And... Or one option is far more lucrative well, than the other. Well, basically, yes. Because, like, if you pre-print the DVD for a dollar, mm-hmm. and you sell it for ten, you make nine dollars. But if you pre if you just upload it to Amazon, up, uh, Amazon sells it for nine, it costs seven dollars in production. Amazon makes seven, you make two. And, and you make as much money as, 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 as you make. And this is the kind of movie that, if it doesn't get the attention that it should, could, could very, disappear. If could very away. easily disappear. Become one of those lost movies. Could become Outback. Mm-hmm. It could become a lot of movies that just had a very limited theatrical release, or like you can find it a a, a, a standard definition version, but finding an HD version. Mm. Mm. You, uh, Panic Room is a movie that I loaned to you that has only ever been released. You ain't getting that. In a, of course, you're getting that. In a standard definition version, I have an HD version because I know someone who works for a television station who happened to get me a very, 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 very high quality file of Panic Room. So I have a Panic Room Blu-ray, but nobody else does <laughs> because that's just the difference between physical media. And digital, and and mind you, also yeah, if you have a digital copy of of Panic Room, it's probably HD. Good for you. Mm. As as long as, as long as that stoppy, copy stays in circulation. Yeah. Because at any point they could just take it out of circulation, and that would be that. Yeah. That's why Josie and the Pussycats cost like a hundred bucks to. It was Spice World actually? A Spice it's, World. Spice World is probably the, uh, the the funniest DVD that I own. That's worth way more money than you'd think it would be. But that's yes. not the important part. The important part right now is that we are going to travel in time. We have dragged out the time machine. We have talked way too much about way too many things that aren't the movie that we we're talking about. And we're going to watch two particular trailers. One is Maniac Cop. The other is Turkey Shoot. So David, step into me, in with, with me, into the time machine. I'm going to go ahead and program these buttons. I apologize. Let me step over your tongue. You Look, it's, that been, it's been there a go. very long oh, day. That's so I wet. just watched this movie oh. today. There might have been drinking involved. Uh, sticky. So, yes. David, travel in time with me for just a couple of minutes. And on the other side, we'll pick a movie and then the episode will be over. It's not going to be that exciting, but here we are. There. We're refueled. Let's do it. David, hit the button. Beep, pop, boop, beep, pop, boop, beep. Slightly distant future. Oh, is it Wednesday yet? It is not Wednesday yet. It's Fuck! Still, it's still the 18th, the day that we were recording this. Oh, it feels like it never ends. David, we watched two trailers. We watched both the trailer for Maniac, uh, Maniac Cop and we watched the trailer for Turkey Shoot. Mm-hmm. Which of these two movies have you chosen to be your fate for next week? Oh, they both seem fun. One of them has Bruce Campbell, the other doesn't. This is true. One is Australian, one is, one is not. But I feel like since we did an Australian one already, I feel like maybe, uh, you know what? I'm gonna. I, I know you're. I know you're gonna be mad because I, this is the second time you tried to pitch it to me in a row. Ken, we're gonna go with Maniac Cop. We're gonna go with Maniac Cop. No, no, no. That's that's totally fine. Because anything that's stated, like anytime there's cop in the title and it's said with a very gruff voice like this, Maniac Cop. I'm like, yeah. It's like seeing Time Cop. No, it, it's. Uh, I mean, so first of all, there's. There are very few movies with the term cop in them that are good. Robocop, Copland, and I'm hoping Maniac Cop. Yeah. But we will, we will find out. I am very excited because I know this film in particular was a huge inspiration to uh, Jill... Uh, God, I'm so sorry. I'm going to butcher your last name here. Gervaisian? Uh, G- uh, G-E-V-A-R-G-I-Z-I-A-N. Ger... The George of Vajarian? George of Vazarian? I'm so sorry, Jill. Um, Jill Six, J I L S I X X, uh, follows me on Twitter. Lovely lady. Directed an incredible, absolutely incredible horror film this year, or sorry, 2020, uh, called The Silas, that I've heard nothing but incredible things about. And in particular, Maniac Cop is, uh, if nothing else, is a great inspiration for the 
trailer and the marketing. Where can you find Stylist? Uh, Stylist, I do not believe, is out just yet. It got uh, it got rave reviews at I believe both South by Southwest and Fantastic Fest, and it is in the uh, it, it is getting released right now, from what I understand. But I've heard nothing but good things. Um, it was uh, because of COVID. It is one of the. It is a horror film that I have seen be incredibly embraced by the community, but I have not yet seen the marketplace give it the what from what I understand it deserves, and from a huge chunk of that is just COVID, from what I understand. So I am uh, I'm really excited to see where some of these ideas that uh, Jill had came from. Okay. All right. I'm looking forward to watching this one. Well, fantastic. All right, uh, David, uh, is there any plugs you want to pluggables or uh, things that you want to tell people where you can be found? I mean, the usual. Uh, David underscore Marlowe on Instagram. Um, you can all, of course, I, I run our uh, Shutter Show page on Instagram as well, which is Shutter underscore show. Um, I also have a Twitter now, Ken. Oh. A Twitter that works. Oh, wow. Okay. I had a Twitter before, but didn't work. Shockingly. I don't know why I was suspended. I'm sure it was because I said something disrespectful politically. Very likely. Towards somebody who was just real butthurt about it. So... Hey, I'm blocked by Seb Gorka. I get it. Yeah. And also William Friedkin, which yeah. I don't understand. Billy. Billy, unblock me. I've never said anything bad about you. I love all of your movies. I own many of them. I've listened to your commentaries. I don't know. I don't. I, I've even searched. I don't believe I've ever even tweeted it at you. So I don't know what I did to get blocked. Billy, what the fuck? Billy Friedkin, unblock me. Billy, get your shit together. Friends of the pod, please tweet, email, come on, Facebook, Instagram, direct message. Parlor, whatever you want to use, just let Billy Friedkin. I don't know think he can even get Parlor now. Ken Stacknick is his friend. And then he should be unblocked. Learn to love, Billy. Indeed. But yeah, but you can find my Twitter uh, at dsour33. Um, it is... It, I, funny story, I pretty much got a Twitter just so I could figure out when the fuck the next stock of PS5 is going to drop. Only okay. to realize my brother sent me one. So, thanks, Ben. I love you so much. You're the best brother ever. All right, well, there we go. And uh, Katie, how dare you lie to me for a whole week about the fact that he was sending this. What the hell? A little bit of drama from the Marlowe household that uh, I'm glad to uh, make sure is part of the <laughs> digital record for the rest of our lives. Uh, my name is Ken Stacknick, and you can follow me at my Twitter and Instagram at, at Ken Stacknick, K-E-N-S-T-A-C-H-N-I-K. You can follow us on Twitter at, at Shutter Show, S-H-U-D-D-E-R-S-H-O-W. And with that, until next week, ladies and gentlemen, boys and ghouls, to all of our non-binary friends and to everyone on the spectrum and in between, please, from the bottom of my heart, go fuck yourself. So hard. Billy, get your shit together. Good night. Good night.